Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast that keeps those quarantine blues away. <laughs> this is Drew Taylor, once again joined by Charles Hood. Yeah, hello. Uh, we're recording this uh, right when the, this madness is all starting, so I don't know where we'll be in a couple weeks when this episode comes out, but hopefully you're all doing okay out there, you're staying safe, and you're washing your hands a lot. Yep. So we're back. Uh, we're back to to hype up Marianne Brandon and Mary Jo Markey interview part two, which just as fascinating as part one. We don't even need to hype it. They're so good. That's true. It's true. I mean, this this is an amazing chat, I feel like. Yeah, totally. I, I just uh, This is one of my favorite interviews we've ever done. It was just so fun, and uh, they're both so great. Oh, I wanted to quickly, before we get into that, you know what I did? Of course, I did my homework assignment. Because I knew I, I, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> I watched I watched all the um, intros to the movies to, to compare the Paramount logos. And it is true. All the Paramount logos for the Mission Impossible movie uh, series, they're all different. What? Yeah. And that continues. That was a, you know from our Making of Ghost Protocol episode. So at that point, it was just one through four. But still, five and six are all are different, too. I think six's logo might have been the same as five. However... If you recall, for Fallout, McCory had to get permission, uh, and, and I think Eddie Hamilton, I don't know if it was Eddie's idea maybe, but in order to get the pace up at the beginning, they actually sped up all the studio logos. Oh, yeah. So if you watch Fallout, all the logos at the beginning, the Bad Robot and Skydance and Paramount, they're actually sped up. Well, okay, well, tell us what the differences are. Well, I mean, I didn't write out all the notes on what they are, but they are a little different, every single one. I mean, the one from the nine, there's, you know, the first one is, it just is a different logo. I mean, the stars go around over the mountain, and then, you know, in the later ones, the stars skip along the water. You know, they add all these little flourishes mm-hmm. to the Paramount logo each time. And I think the Ghost Protocol one still does have the 100th Paramount logo on it. So that's still on there. Okay. Because sometimes it's funny when you watch old movies and it's like the company is owned by an entirely different company back then. Yeah. Which I think all the Paramount movies were Viacom still, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird when you get like, it'll be a a new movie release where it'll be like a new Universal logo and then it'll be a super old Warner Brothers logo after it. Right. I hate when they make them, when they replace the old logos though. Yeah, that's no good. I don't like it. Uh, Another thing... um, uh, thank you to McNuge82 on Twitter. He sent us a video of Brad Pitt accepting the Annie Award. We did not have this as part of our Ghost Protocol making of, but clearly during the making of Ghost Protocol, Brad Bird was accepting this uh, award, this animation award, uh, which is, I think, the Annie Awards are the animation awards, right? Correct. Uh, so there's this video of, uh, <laughs> if you, we'll, we'll post it when this episode comes out, but. Uh, Brad Bird is held hostage by Tom Cruise and Simon Pegg in a hotel room. It's during the shooting of Ghost Protocol, and Brad Bird is doing this funny statement uh, that's about how he's moved on from animation, and he's he feels like he's on to better things now that he's doing live action. And then they reveal that it's actually Tom Cruise and Simon Pegg with a gun to Brad Bird's head. It's pretty funny. (laughs) I think I actually vaguely remember seeing this, but if it's online, we have to find it and put it up on Twitter. No, oh, you didn't see it? He sent it to us. Oh, no, I didn't. See, what did he send it to us on? He sent it to us on Twitter when uh, when we released the making of Ghost Protocol episodes. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't see that. But now, now I will. I, I must have forgotten. Well, yeah, we're going to do a whole, we'll post it when this episode comes out and I'll send it to you. But it's pretty hilarious. Um, it's definitely worth watching. Um, should we just jump right into the interview and then come back, uh, circle back around when it's done? Yeah, I think so. Let's do it. This is uh, this is Marianne Brandon and Mary Jo Markey, and they're both awesome. And enjoy. Uh, so okay, so when you're you're reviewing the dailies. Is there, uh, you know, you see a sequence that you're really excited about? Just, do you fight? Did you, just, did you ever fight over anything? Did you fight over the batting? Do you ever, like, how do you decide who gets what? I mean, you know, like we're women. We just work it out. <laughs> we're very kind of like, sure, if you love it, do it. I'll do this. Was there anything in particular that either of you was like, oh, I really want to do this one? 
I, there were two things I actually really wanted to do in the movie. And I, I just remember saying I'd really like to cut this and you didn't have any issue with it. I, I wanted to do that opening sequence. I just thought it looked really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do the sequence in Italy because I'm Italian. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I love, the Vatican sequence is so amazing. It was so you can, much you don't fun know if you to want do. to talk about that whole, I mean, it's such a huge set piece. Yeah, I, I had just a great time doing it. I mean, from the very... I, I mean, I worked really hard on it. I remember that just that little bit of, of Tom climbing up that wall. I think I cut it 20 ways, you know, oh, I mean, wow. just, just looking at it all these different ways over and over again. I mean, that's the beauty of electronic editing. Um, it was just a blast. I don't know what to say about it other, other than I did, you know, I did try. I am that just this is why I'm so slow. I try a billion different ways of putting something together. And uh, I'm just really happy with the way it turned out and I don't really think there were that many changes in it except cutting out some bits and I remember um, like just sort of changing a lot of what they said to each other. Right. Um, there was a, a whole issue with, I, I remember this so well, they had a, a Philip Seymour Hoffman dummy that they were going to hold up behind the door you, you know that whole sequence. Yeah. 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 And do you remember this? Like yeah, we got yeah, it yeah. into the room and I we looked at it and I just said, That does not look like my Philip Seymour <laughs> I mean, this is not gonna fly. And I I think I either texted I don't know whether I texted or called or whatever I I said to JJ, um I don't think it's, you know, you really need to look at these, you need to look at this, man, because I don't think it's going to work. And he was like, really? It looked so good on the lens finder. <laughs> like, Dude, I really think you need to look at it. So they came over to the cutting room and it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny how they all thought it was going to work on set. And I looked at it for like one second and knew it was not going to work. Yeah, but I so mean, they you had to convince yourself that. of yeah, I guess so you many do. things I guess you set. do. <laughs> and it was, it was, a, was it John, uh, Jonathan Reese myers that was holding him yeah. up? Yeah, and it, he's not the biggest guy in the world, you know, was right. but, he, but they did redo it with with Philip really, you know, him really yeah, holding up. That's funny. Yeah. I remember, I, I thought I heard somewhere that it was, and maybe it was for a different reason, and this is good to get clarity. I remember reading that something about Tom Cruise had said that the suspense of that scene didn't work in the bathroom without a close up of Jonathan Reese Myers looking like sweating it out behind the door. I, don't but I guess maybe, I never maybe, heard maybe this is like what that. the reshoot was, was not because of that, but because just Philip Seymour Hoffman didn't look right. Well, I, mean, I never heard anything I, about Oh, wow. I, mean, maybe I don't know if it was in the commentary. I don't remember hearing it or reading it somewhere. Well, yeah, you know, that commentary knows. is so screwed up, I have to say, honestly. <laughs> Marianne is just silent. I don't know if I should go public with this or not. But <laughs> why, why is it screwed up? There's, no, po there's no possibility that... Story. Right, right. There's no possibility that JJ's ever going to hear this, right? There were about, I doubt he would ever take the time to no. listen to our podcast. <laughs> Even if we get him on, he won't listen to his yes. episode. Probably. I know there were about a dozen things that he talked about in that commentary that he attributed to Marianne that were my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I thought to myself, hmm, I guess I'm not really making an impression. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you know you know this, right? You know, I for so many years I just let it fly <laughs> out of me. I mean for well, as many you know, I probably just, it, would too if I were you. <laughs> you know, no, maybe he goes, just calls you I both mean, Mary Ann. It goes both yeah. ways. It's like, you no, know, we no, all no, no, no. <laughs> No, just, he never. I don't think he ever made that mistake. Oh, I think he did. You did? He, he never called oh, me Marianne. Sure. I don't know. Oh, hey, <laughs> he didn't call me that, but I mean, he. Oh, just, in his head? Oh, no, possibly. but like you know, so and so had this idea, or Mary Jo uh, had this idea, and you're like, didn't we talk about that for like two hours? <laughs> and you know, at some point, I just stopped <laughs> listening because I figured, you know, it'll all wipe out in yeah. the wash. Yeah, and, right. and, obviously, and, you know, you know, and then you know. The truth is, um, people forget. Yeah. They for I remember um, a really close friend of mine was um, talking about a film he was working on. It was, anyway, and he had an idea in the cutting room. He's an editor. He had an idea, and he told the director, and the director was like, "That's going to save the scene." And he, the director picked up the phone, called the his producer, and said, "Bob just had this great idea." And obviously the producer was like, great idea, call the studio, tell them. The director put down the phone, called the studio, and went, well, I just had this great idea. <laughs> 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 Who's going to save the film? And the, oh. the studio was like, amazing. 
amazing. Oh and it just, God. you know, yeah. so things go, you know. Oh, well, that's nothing new. I mean, no, oh my God. Exactly. How many so, times? So I just, it kind of goes with the job. Right. And yeah. um, I just figure, look, you know, at this point, I was very proud of those fil- the films, very proud of the films Mary Jo and I have done together. And I feel like they're very well cut and they do look seamless mm-hmm. to me. Oh, I, I think don't so know. Too. And I am, um, you know, am proud to be associated with them. So I think we did great work. How, how the ideas came together and we all had, Mary Jo's had incredible amount of spectacular ideas and, <laughs> You know, I've had ideas, JJ, and they all kind of merge into making what I think are really successful films. And I'm, yeah, I listen to those. Co- Sometimes I don't even listen to those commentaries. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I, it was it was, it was my so... first big feature, and I listened to that. One. Yeah, and then, and then I learned not to listen to exactly. them. And you know, and I, I, you you fall into this trap sometimes when you do these podcasts where you <laughs> say <Sorry>. something. <laughs> oh, but no. it is true. You say something with full intention of like what you're trying to express and then suddenly you're listening to it back and going, wait, <laughs> they what I said and what they heard is completely <laughs> right. not. But that's a good disclaimer. True. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, I do have this, I've made this, I'm very near the end of my career. I don't know how many more movies I'm going to make. And I have made this resolution to be completely honest. <laughs> oh, we love that. That's good. Oh. I'm going to make that resolution. Do it. <laughs> Starting you know right what? now. You know what? We, as editors, this is something we have to do. I took complete... I life. know you do. I, I know you, you do. know I've always agreed with that. I know. One I'm, of the reasons that editors do not get the credit they deserve for the contributions they make to films is that they are reluctant to take any credit away from the director. And mm-hmm. so many editors are so damn different, deferential to their directors there's very, I mean, if you listen to Thelma Schumacher, you would think she never had an idea in her life. And right. that woman is brilliant. You yes. know she yeah. has really done it. She is so deferential to Scorsese. Yeah. And I just think we have to stop doing this. We have yes. to start taking credit for Well, our we work. always talk about how so, Tar- yeah. yes, Tarantino's yeah. movies have taken a dip since Sally died. There is no yeah. question. Yeah. I think this last There's one now idea. has come back up. I still but, think she would have after. Made it I think she would have too. Yeah, I think she would have too. I think Django in particular would have benefited um, a lot. Well, yeah. she, uh, from what I understand and the little I know, Sally, she had a very firm hand with him. Yeah, she was very, and I think that both Mary Jo and I uh, don't mean to speak to you for you, no. but I think we both have a very firm hand. My experiences with JJ. Like, I mean, we are we, kind of relentless about yes. things that we think are not working. Yeah, right. that's you know, great. If yeah. I were, if I had been in that cutting room, I would have, you know, that cutting room that you're just talking about. Once upon a time in Hollywood, I would have been relentless about certain scenes. I would yeah. have because it's a wonderful film that needed some. Well, yes, <laughs> and it needed yeah. more shaping, and yeah. it did need because you did kind of fall out of the film and. Yes, it re you know reignited it at yeah. certain yeah. times, but it definitely did that, and that's not what you want from a film like that. There are films that benefit from that, right? But that's not one. <laughs> do, do you want to ask your editing question about the two different line readings at the beginning and end of the movie from the same scene? Well, oh, oh okay. yeah. So in MI three, the opening scene, it does. I don't. I don't follow what happened here. I don't know if that was a choice from the beginning or if something had changed in the edit. Because at the begin, so at the end, because uh, you know it's the same. They pick up, yeah. yeah. But they're asking him uh, about the rabbit's foot, like, mm-hmm. and he delivered the rabbit's foot already. And then when Billy Crudup comes in, he says, "We had like, sorry, we had to, you know, they pretend kill Julia, but, right?" And then he's like, "I'm sorry, we had to do that, but it was the only way we would know if that you he really, if you right really thing. gave it." But he didn't really do that. He kind of says no. Right? At the like beginning. They, yeah, at the beginning, they like ask him, hey, you know, tell, like, give, you know, we want the rabbit's foot. And then he's like, I want to help you, but I can't. No. No. And then they kill her. But he gave it to them, right? Yeah, he did. Yes. So I don't understand why. He's... It's all, it's, and that, fa- that first sequence is all about whatever ruse he can come up with. At first, he says, I gave it to you because he really thinks he did. Right. He did. And then later on, when he realizes in that sequence, when he realizes that answer didn't satisfy him, he says, okay, I didn't really give it to you, but right. I know where it is. I mean, it's all, it's just whatever he, does that answer? Wait. Sort of. I mean, I guess it's, to me, when Billy Crudup sits down and says, well, that proved that you had it, but if he's now saying no, he didn't, then it would kind of prove that he didn't give it to them. I don't know, it just confused me. I just wanted to... <laughs> 
I know what he's saying. Okay. <laughs> he's saying he's that insane. Because Ethan decides to just try to give him any answer that will save Julia, when we come back to the scene and Billy Crudup comes in, and to, how did it prove it? Because he then told Owen Davy that he, in fact, didn't give him the rabbit's foot. And so, then he could get it for him. Right. So why but did he, Billy Crudup well, so sit down him. and then say... We had to do I that in order to mean. prove that yes. you gave us the thing. But but really, he said he didn't he give it to He said he didn't give it to him. He said all sorts of things. But maybe that is, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I always want to I realized that recently. I, I we we've watched these movies really so did. many times. Yeah. Yeah. I still yeah. think he really did give it to him. And, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. He right. did, of course. Yeah, yeah, no. I was just wondering from Billy Crudup's point of view mm, why that why that made sense. I know. Should we talk about their other work before we go back to the hard hitting questions? Yeah, oh sure. God. Yeah, yeah. Okay. More, more, oh my yeah. God. Well, so you, so uh, Mary Jo, if I'm not mistaken, you started with JJ earlier. I you did. Were on I started Felicity. on Felicity. Yeah. I actually visited the set of Felicity when I was 16 years old. Oh my God. When I was visiting Which episode? colleges in California. Oh my so God. it was in Which... 1999. I was on it then? Yeah. So I don't know. Oh I was on set. How did you happen? My uncle was a camera operator on the show. Oh yeah. my God. So that's uh, so great. But anyway, so you were on Felicity, I was. and then, and and uh, so I mean, what was that? What was the experience? How did you start with JJ, and and then you know how did that evolve? Oh, it's just uh, you know, it's just honestly a total coincidence. I was looking for work, and Alan Heim was a friend of mine, and he's also a friend of Stan Selfis's, who had cut the pilot, and they were just looking for somebody, and that was Matt Reeves too right yeah it yeah. was that's how I originally I mean it was really a terrific experience to meet both of those guys yeah it was the first TV I'd only worked in like independent features and um it's, I'd done some TV movies and but I needed a job and I just said oh, okay I'll just do a couple episodes what the heck and when it <laughs> had, had the meeting that's happens. how it always <laughs> happens they just lure you in <laughs> and then I just happened to cut when JJ directed his first episode it just happened to fall to me in the rotation and and then he decided to make it a two over the hot christmas holidays he called and said i think i'm i think i need to make it a two episode uh show <laughs> you know i mean I, he wanted to expand it to right. two episodes and i don't know we just, you know that was kind of a, a little bit of a bonding thing because it was the first thing he directed and I hadn't really cut that much TV at that point, but I, I like cut. It was a little bit faster than I was used to cutting, um, but it was all great. It was fun. I had a good time on it. I, of course, ended up staying two and a half years instead of a couple of episodes. <laughs> I went and did. I, I did feel a little bit like I was going a little stale, and I just and then Ken. I'd gotten to know Ken Olin while I was on that. He did something else. Went with him. But then I heard, when I heard about Alias, I thought it would be fun to work on that. So I asked JJ if I could come on to that. And that was a great experience for me. I really hadn't cut much action before. So I learned a lot about cutting action. And right. I also only did that for two years. So. Right. <laughs> How long are you on Lost? Only one year. Only because one year. Okay. The, the first, first year of, just the first season because he, that we did. That was a long season too. Wasn't it? Oh my God. That? I cut, I, I cut like half of those episodes. Wow. So <laughs> half of those hours, I swear. Um, but it was great. That yeah. Lost was a fantastic experience. I mean, I would say the Lost pilot and like Star Trek, the first Star Trek, was some, some of my favorite things I ever did. And Mission. Mission was extremely fun to cut. Yeah. Extremely Star fun Trek. To before, we, before we get to Star Trek, so yeah. then you, and then you hopped on with J.J. on Alias, mm -hmm. right? And how did that happen? Well, I was working features, and I had done a little bit of television, and I had a friend who was producing Felicity, Sarah. Sarah. And uh, Sarah Kaplan. And she called me and asked me if I wanted to work on Felicity, and I said, no, you know, I'm trying to go back to features and then I did and then when Alias came up she called me and said you really need to meet JJ and my kids were getting older and uh we I'd already been on location with them a couple of times the nanny the nanny's kid the dog <laughs> you know it was like it was and the headmistress of my son's school was like you cannot take him out of school again or you're not gonna have a place so I said sure I'll meet this guy and uh I went to meet JJ and that was when they the offices in Culver City right and I sit down that's and... where you visited right yeah it must yeah. have been I mean it was so, so long I don't even remember I'm in his office and he just starts talking to me was. and I swear to God for an hour he just made crack jokes and I laughed 
I didn't. I don't think I said anything. And I, I thought this guy thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> but he was hilarious. And he said, "Okay, I'll see you Monday." <laughs> oh wow! And um, that's. I think I joined last. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was the last person on because it was you and Jenny. Yeah. And, um, and then I stayed for four years. Wow. <laughs> Which and you directed a couple, and episodes, I directed right? a couple when Mary how, Jo went to Lost. That? I direct, um, it was good fun. It was really good fun. It's very interesting directing a television show. It's very interesting when you come from within because you have a lot more to prove because everyone else on the set who thinks they should direct doesn't want you directing, and right. so there's a psychological thing. Like you know, if all things being equal, if I walk on the set, it's one thing. If JJ walks on the set, you know he he's already commit. You know has or Ken walks on the set. They all immediately respond, and you're like, "Okay, I gotta win this whole right. trust thing." And um, but luckily, I had a very good relationship with um, Jennifer Garner and Bradley Cooper, who both had freely came into the cutting room quite often, and so uh, they knew me, and they were very supportive. And uh, and then when Mission came up, I had a choice in my career whether to pursue directing in television or editing features, bigger features with JJ. And um, it was a tough one, I got to say, because there were other people in the cutting room who like there was another editor called Fred Toy, who now has a big TV he directing stuff. stuff now yeah, too, yeah, big TV directing yeah. career. And um, even my assistant, Kristen Wendell, now directs she does. television. Oh my God. She does The Flash, you know, so like there was, an, you know, yeah. I mean, there was it was a time I definitely could have gone that way, um, and uh, you could go that way now. <laughs> that, that is, uh, yeah, <laughs> True. You could. Yeah. I was could. such a demand for women directors. I know. You honestly could. Um, anyway, I didn't at the time because one of the things was I really didn't want to be away from home. Then my kids were at an age that I just wanted to be around, mm -hmm. and I knew that directing television, I'd be in Vancouver, New York. Atlanta, you know, six months of the year I'd be, and it would be constant. And um, and Mission was really interesting. I, I thought it would just be really fun. And Did you have any relationship with the old show? Because you said you'd watch the old show, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I grew up with the old show. Who didn't? Yeah. I yeah. mean, that was that's our generation. You know, this, whatever night it was on, that you tuned into Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, yeah. I mean, that's my relationship with it. That's wow. cool. How it's did a, you two become such fans? <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the first movie, I think, has really hit us at the right age. We were 13 when that movie came out. Yeah. And uh, so then we, you know, my dad was uh, told me I should go watch all the old shows. So oh. I, would, I would go into New York and the Museum of Television and Radio and watch the oh old episodes. Oh my God, that's so and, great. So he's we, just always, he's, he's really desperate for his father's approval. Yes, that's, 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 that's the impetus behind this whole podcast. This is, a, we're just working through a lot of stuff. Um, I understand. Like, you know, you, are we all? Yeah. I'm still working on why did I choose editing over here? Right. <laughs> I mean, forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but so we let's, uh, Star Trek. We're both we huge fans Trek. of this first Star Trek movie. Uh, it's so ooh, great. It's one of my faves, too. I mean, yeah. it's, I have a poster on my wall, right? I know. Yeah. I have the poster that they never released. Ooh, oh, what's that? Oh, it's this fantastic yeah, yeah. poster it made it's made up of four posters <laughs> and it is the delta shield and then it has in black and that's all in like red gold blue and um and then it has uh uhuru kirk spock and um nero oh so is it and, four full-size posters four, no mini oh, like and one, you put four, them together and they make oh, one cool. big poster but it was intended to be four there were yes. gonna be full-size posters it was, remembered, it was meant to be like they put them up all over the place but then you then you put them, them together, together and then it makes the, and then oh, they decided was, not to go with it oh but you have it i have it that's you know, awesome i thought you were talking about the one that said what year did it come out well it ended oh, up coming out in 09 but oh, it was nine, supposed yeah. to come out christmas 08 yes. right yeah i have the poster that says star trek 2008 wow <laughs> that's cool Don't you yeah. have that? i think i have that yeah. Too. Yeah. I, I still have that well, I I have that, too. that must have been a unique experience that you actually got more time to edit and i think you can actually feel it in the movie that it is just so sort of like laser cut uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, every time every time that movie's on cable or something, I mean, it's it's hard not to watch it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, oh, I that scene's it. coming up. Oh, that scene's <laughs> coming up. And you and he had to cut these like huge sections of the movie mm -hmm. out of it too. The the Klingon prison. 
Oh, oh yeah, that's remember that. all that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I cut all that stuff. <laughs> all that stuff Waste it. <laughs> well, we and used it in a, We did use it in a flashback. We used a little a bit. Little that's right. Bit of it. That yeah. nice shot flashback. of Nero. Yeah. Yeah. Nero, yeah. where you're like, where is he? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> where, where they call him upset. also, and he's on the table, and they come in and yeah. call him, we're ready now. <laughs> that was um, all created in the cutting room. Yeah, so that was a lot of cutting room creation. <laughs> yeah. And, um, that was an interesting. Yeah, that also. I think that works also because it's funny. The it film's is fun. funny. There know? is there is some humor in it. Now the um, second in the movie the in general, that, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's. It was also just the the, cast the build up. So good. It, the, yeah, because I remember thinking, okay, they're recasting Kirk and everything. And I remember being, I remember being very skeptical of this movie, mm. and then seeing it, and they're all so great. The entire cast. Yeah, it's it's the only Webster. critics yeah. reading I've ever been to where the critics applauded at the end of the movie. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So good job. Yeah, I guys. remember. <laughs> that. Yeah. We no, did we... get fantastic uh, <laughs> response and reviews and everything. It was really fun. It was really really fun. It's just a fun movie. Yeah. Then the second movie, a little bumpier. It was a little bumpier. Hard. Not yeah. really sure retelling the con story was a great idea. Yeah. Well, here's, my, here's my question from an editor's standpoint. The scene where he reveals that he's con, the the Trek diehards go, yeah, we, we kind of figured he's con. And then people who don't know who con is go, Say, who's it's con? Which, is which includes, con? in yeah. that context, Kirk. Including, and Spock, yes. I think, yes, exactly. don't know who he is. Yeah. Right. Was that a hard one to get a grip on? Yeah, we on? talked okay. about it for okay. a long time. And you know, Here, here's an opportunity honestly... for you to be honest, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. This is one. This is I'll sometimes I wonder. <laughs> what did you say? I won't be doing any more films after this. <laughs> <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> I mean, I didn't mean that nobody cares about what you say, but nobody cares about what we say. <laughs> <laughs> right. As long as we say it together. Exactly. And then they'll be like, oh, Marianne said that. Yeah. No, Mary Jo. No, no, like, Mary Jo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they won't know which one of you said. Yeah, exactly. okay. That's the numbers. The strength of numbers. <laughs> now, honestly, sometimes I wonder if that movie would have done better if they just hadn't, and this was not JJ's decision, if they just hadn't done that whole thing of saying it's not con as part of yeah. the publicity. Yes, that was a big decision. I I remember going to a press thing where they said, we've got this great character, John Harrison or whoever, and everybody's like, give me a break. (laughs) We all know it, you know? But the ruse went on for ever. Yeah. And so this is standard. Well, what I'm saying is like standard knowledge. Everybody knows. Oh well, that it I mean, they, done well, that was the way that they were presenting it to press at the time. Yeah. Was that? It there was, but there was a lot of speculation. No, but I mean, Everybody, a lot of people say it would have done better if it, if I don't they know just if it hadn't done, done that. that. But the, but the Nero storyline is so conish. It was weird. You know, I feel like you guys already kind of had a little bit of a revenge story, yeah. and you know, somebody getting back at a long-standing Starfleet member and all that. that yeah. yeah. That's a good point too. It felt like yeah. it had a lot, the first movie had a lot more history to it and weight, whereas the second movie, it was just this random guy. Yeah. Like, there needed to be some kind of setup more, which, by the way, the opening of the second one is wonderful. Oh, and that IMAX but, presentation. But, but, like, it needed oh. to have more of a setup between Khan. To, yeah. Because, like, when you... I didn't even watch the old show, but I've seen Wrath of Khan... And they set it up so much that you know these two characters have right. so much history. And if you've seen the, show, the episode they, of the show. Yeah, or, yeah. 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 Well, like I said, when we started, I'm not sure it was the best idea. <laughs> you did what you could. Let's be but I, no. I still think the movie's we fun. It really is fun. We worked so yes. hard on that movie. And, and we there were you know, scenes that were rewritten and reshot to try to make things better and make the thematic elements clearer. Yeah. And it just... So were you guys all on board when Jay just said, I'm... They gave me Star Wars, or were you? Was there any trepidation on your end? No, not no, for me. No, I, mean, I was I, exciting to think okay. about doing this huge. Well, it thing. was a yeah. big, big. De- well, you know, he did. It was also that he <laughs> he first said he wasn't going to do, do it. it. Yes, I remember. I, we talked to, <laughs> to and he the even person said who to us, to he was first. like, "I'm not going to do it." So you know, and I actually took a film. Oh. I took another film at Marvel, and. Committed to it. And then had to back out. And then I'm, you know, and I'm still paying for that (laughs) because uh, then he said, now I'm going to do it and I'd like you to do it very much like you to do it. (laughs) It was like, it's Star Wars, it's Marvel, it's Star Wars, it's, and you know, it was a, that is a very, very, granted the Marvel one was like months out 
Um, but what was the, can you tell us which Marvel movie? It was? Guardians of the Galaxy. And I loved the script for Guardians, and I really enjoyed meeting James Gunn, and he was this energetic, full of ideas, music, joke. I mean, he just had, he knew, I knew this guy knew the film he was going to make, mm-hmm, right. and that's really impressive. And um, and then there's JJ going, but we always work together. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, family? Yeah, right. <laughs> Boyfriend. <laughs> um so, yeah, I mean, but it's Star Wars, and God knows, you know, I grew up in, with Star Wars. Yeah, right. and Star Wars is a phenomenon that is hard to deny. Yeah, and um, so it was very exciting to be a part of that, to be a part of that reboot. And he was excited. And wait, wait, I did you feel like the pressure though? I mean, in the Bob Iger book, he says that he told JJ this is a four billion dollar movie. Bob Iger says yeah. that he said that to yeah, JJ. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. I mean, no what's, what's that pressure? <laughs> I think um, a lot of us work really well under pressure. <laughs> like okay. Sometimes it can be a motivator. Okay. And I think for JJ, you know, I would say a lot of things about JJ and all of them great, but he is, and one of the great things about him is he thinks big. So everything's always big. And he, you know, if you're going to say to him, this is a $4 billion pressure, he's going to bring his $8 billion game. Right. So I, when that all sort of happened, I knew it was going to be a big, big film. And Mm -hmm. it was going to be full of ideas and creative ideas that were going to be really fun to to, um, sink my teeth into. Did you... Uh, there was an earlier version of the movie that was Michael Arndt that was working on the script. Did you ever get a glimpse of that, or do you know what that was all about? We read that. I, we did read it. Oh, we read a long outline. Yeah, I think we read the outline. Did they have the three movies outlined at that point? Was, no. Or was Arndt was just working it on the first that, one? It was just that. Just that. How one. different was that from what the final movie is? Um, I don't remember it bearing a lot of resemblance, to be honest. I think it was quite different, yeah. and I think they just saw it dif- completely right. differently. And also, I don't know that they their work styles were very different. Hmm. Um, I can't really speak to it because I wasn't around those days. You know, we weren't yeah. there. I was doing something and Mary Jo was doing something else. So It was something he, about like, like one of them, I don't even remember. It was, it was work style. It was like one of them needed to flesh out everything before moving story. And the other right. one and then needed was just it. like, well, well, I, was ticking. I, yeah. I, remember, I remember hearing Michael Arndt said he needed six more months to get this. And then yeah, they said, I, we're not giving you six more months. And he was like, all right, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Um, I think JJ is definitely, he likes, he does um, seem to enjoy a lot of input and ideas and you can put them splash them up there on the wall and you know their ideas and then he takes them and kind of we you know we all move them around and I don't I think Michael's a much more plotting like this leads to this to right. this yeah. this and if you take the a out d is going to fall apart yeah so um that is a real style clash and then when JJ started working with Lawrence Kasdan I I think Larry just kind of fed him idea let jj have ideas and then or you know listen to jj's ideas and then he kind of fed them and enhanced them and guided them more so i right. think that was a more um he was also really excited to work with larry cast he was very oh, excited that's, to work yeah. with him yes and i think that relationship was, was solid yeah. yeah did they and did they have plans for where they thought the next movie should go or would go and that, and where they deviated from you know, that's an interesting um, question. I think they were just so concentrating on getting one up and rebooting the series. And um, I, when I first started on the film, I didn't realize that it was going to go then to another director. Um, I didn't even think about it. In hindsight, I wish JJ had done them all and I wish they had spread them out into like a nine year period or yeah. a 10 year period. and you know, and given it sort of like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, I do remember them hearing them talking about certain elements that they thought should be, you know, things that would follow through the three, but... And then they had to sort of... I mean, you you weren't back on the um, rise of uh, Skywalker, but you, you were... And so, Did you yeah, talk, was there talk about you coming back? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just decided not to do the film um, for... 
I just wanted to do something else, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> I was sort of, I sort of told my agent, no more, no and more you were spaceships, no more aliens, no more, crazy, crazy, no more monsters. Right. It wasn't, I mean, we started, we had the same exact schedule as Force Awakens, only Force Awakens started in May, so we, it was June, July. I mean, it was two months difference, too much, two months of a crunch. Too much um, shorter? Too much shorter. Because your schedule seemed shorter yeah. to me. And, you know, it was a big film. It had to encompass a lot. And it had to, wherever eight led, nine had to answer and You had to wrap up every, everything. You had to wrap, had to wrap up three nine trilogies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a big, uh, it was a lot. And the film is chock full. I love the film. I think it's just got so much in it and so much going for it. And, I, you know, inevitably... It wasn't going to please everyone. Right. Right. Did it evolve a lot in post-production? That's kind of the sense that we get. Yes, it evolved in post-production, but there were a lot of basic ideas that were there to begin with and where we were going to take the main character. And J.J. and Chris Terrio, the writer, um, very much wanted Ray and Finn and Poe to be together in this one and have an adventure the way Luke and Leia and Han... Right. did and um, you know they're good together they're emotionally connected and um, so there was yeah there was some figuring and rejiggering but there was a basics that it goes along with the script right mm -hmm. was there more because it just came out in the news in the last week that, that supposedly I don't know if this was in the movie ever but the Palpatine was actually a clone was that part of the movie I'm just going to straight up ask was Palpatine <laughs> added post production <laughs> No, he was there. Him. Okay, oh, he was there. Sure. Okay. He that um, they announced him a while. Ian, oh my before. god! Well, they, I was at celebration, but I've never met somebody who's given his all as much as that guy. <laughs> I mean, even, oh my god! He just got up <laughs> he was there on that thing, yeah. thrilled every day. He was like, "What can I do for you? <laughs> you want to look like this? You want to look like that? You know? I mean, he was just such so game to be the emperor." <laughs> Was there Back. more set up for the character, though? There's a little bit more, but, you know, he, uh, you could have straight up asked me, he's more than a clone, he's not a clone, he's more than a clone. <laughs> wow, but okay. That's how I feel about Charles. Yes. Yeah. That's all about, you know, yeah. we, it's just like you, that, but you're more than that. Um, Honestly, if you think about it, does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, he was there. <laughs> he was there. Yeah. He was back. Was, was Matt, did Matt Taylor actually film anything? Because they announced him as being part of the cast, and then he Who's was Matt sitting uh, from uh, Doctor Who. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't that. know. No, I don't okay. Know. Yeah, I don't know. He was sitting there were there. so many people in Stormtrooper masks. Oh, that's oh, how no. would I know? Oh, wait, yeah. this, Daniel day. Craig does a cameo in the first movie. The first yeah, but that, yeah. Didn't, that was a chock full of cameos with people. No, in the are there any? Well, that, are there Tom any that people don't know that. about? Are, are, you, what you say? Tom Hardy was a stormtrooper in one of them. He was, in, but in, in, I think I it was in Rogue One. Rogue One. Are okay. there any other names that haven't come out that you know of that were in stormtrooper? I thought they all came out, didn't they? Like Michael was one. Yeah, Jacino is always one. and he reprises his role in Ralph Breaks the Internet. That's a little Easter egg. The stormtrooper in Ralph Breaks the Internet is voiced by Michael Jacino. Yeah. his character from Force uh, Awakens. Yeah. Well, speaking of animation, oh yeah, had the line in Force Awakens. Did um, he did. He had the line. Isn't it? Doesn't he bring that box in or something? Did he? Maybe he didn't have a line. All right. Here's, the, line. here's the last Skywalker so, question. Hold on. Oh yeah. Sorry. Before we get to before we, before we <laughs> shift to this is my birthday. This is my this is oh, my happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. Yeah. birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Saying. Uh, <laughs> the 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 end on Tatooine. How much finessing was there? People compared shots from uh, that m pulled from. I know, movie. isn't that crazy? Which is, scene? The ending scene, the very, scene, final, the very scene. final scene, the where she's standing on Tatooine and she is looking at the two sons. People are speculating that Ben Solo was still alive in some version. I know. Here's the thing. <laughs> I, getting nothing. Getting you, nothing. You probably know more than I do. <laughs> I people like were at the when I. I would ask for certain interviews. People would ask me questions, and I'd be like, "What do you think? What? Yeah. I mean, there was one thing where people were like, "So JJ's director's cut." I'm like, "Yeah." Oh, that's the most annoying thing. I know. I'm yeah. like, "You did you see the film? Yeah. And there's his cut. Well, the best yeah. was like, "Where's the secret just, cut?" Yeah. I'm like. When did you do? When who would do? A, when would we have <laughs> well, time? So, yeah, somebody said to me he had he had uh, trouble getting this version done. The fact that they, somebody thinks there's another version. I was like, insane. why would we go there? 
there. Why would we waste that kind of energy? Yeah. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. So, or somebody asked me something else that I was absolutely amazed at. Oh, the relationship between Poe and Finn. Oh, the Were gay, they meant to yeah. be romantically involved? I was like, are they are? <laughs> I That's a fan. I it's a was fan, not yeah. cutting I read for that, that yeah. before that. Right. I read that but be- I was even not, before the film. I was film. not cutting the scene for that. And right. I don't yeah. think they were directed that way. So the answer to the tattooing thing is they shot, we shot that. Okay. At, in the desert. Dressed it as tattooing. Yeah. Yeah. Decided, you know, all that is as it's written. Okay. Wow. Were there, did you have any footage of the actual actors as the force ghosts? Or was it just dialogue? You know where they're telling her there to get a... up and all Oh, that. that. No, that's dialogue. That's all dialogue. Okay. And that's all shot. real dialogue. Yeah. We recorded all New, of that. Yeah. Yeah, where she goes up through the stars and yeah. you start to hear. Yeah, it was just a question of what order to put it in. Right. Right. Who do you want to hear first? Um, People are yeah. really clamoring for those animated characters. I know. You know, we had thought about it. We thought about... There was, you know, obviously we talked about absolutely every possibility. Sure. So if you did bring it all back, it would kind of have been sort of Avenger-ish... Yeah, right. if they were just the there. Because yeah. they all come back at the end. And really, where were you going to put them all? And were they going to be in space? You know, when you start to think it, flesh out an idea like that, where do you go with an idea yeah. like that? Yeah. Whereas the voices are really powerful. Yeah. And, and, and Luke says to her on the island, you know, you know, and even in the beginning, Leia says, you know, you'll, you'll hear the voices. Yeah. And so she then, you know, and she's like, I can't hear them. I'll never, you know, I'll never hear them. And then she hears it. So it's all set up. All right. We're back. We're back from that amazing chat. Uh, total transparency. I love Mary Jo's commitment to telling the truth. Yes. Um, being honest, very much appreciated, especially when we kind of get into some some Skywalker stuff and some some Star Star Trek stuff. It's just uh, it's it was really refreshing. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool to hear all the, all the Rise of Skywalker stuff, and then also the you know about the MI three commentary. Um, you know about how they they got some things wrong on the MI3 commentary and and uh, I'm just glad that we weren't uh, we weren't called out on our commentary. Thank God she didn't listen to. Our, oh yeah, our mission. That's Impossible true. Thing. Yeah, if you want to hear our commentaries, you sign up for our Patreon bonus content. Um, we've got commentaries for all six Mission Impossible movies. It's true. Also, I love I love them talking about Sally Menke and uh, you know they're very honest about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and their thoughts on it. And about editors not getting enough credit in general. It's really, really, I, I just, it was a really cool chat with them. Yeah. They're amazingly talented and they've done so many different things throughout the years. So, yeah. It was really, it was really a thrill. They also were just such lovely people. Yeah. So, yeah. And next week, uh, they're going to talk about The Last Jedi. And that's pretty fun. You got to definitely come back next week to hear them talk about The Last Jedi because that's really good stuff. Yes, and, and until next week, if you want to sign up for our Patreon, that would be super, super awesome. Patreon.com forward slash like the fuse. Uh, if you want to rate, review, like, and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast, that would be super helpful. If you want to buy a t-shirt or a magnet or a pen on our Tee Public store, also that would be great. Or just telling people that you love the show and that it's great and worth listening to. Everything helps. I feel like we're starting to get more, more listeners and... Um, you know, we're not going to stop doing this, especially if they push the next movies back. We're going to be on the hook even longer. So please tell people to listen. <laughs> yes, spread the word. Uh, and uh, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon, and it was mixed and edited by Luke Burson. And a special thank you to Jacob from Holland. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, uh, we love you all out there. And, uh, if you want to watch the old show, the old Mission Impossible TV show, that's on CBS All Access right now. So check that out and come back for more awesome Marianne and Mary Jo stuff next week. And then after that, David James, and, uh, he's the still photographer for MI3, 4, 5, and 6, and he has incredible stories and did all the like iconic photos from those movies, took them all, um, which we use on social media all the time. So that's a really good chat. And then after that, do we want to reveal one of our names of people we talk to or do we want to wait? I don't really know the order yet. So I'll still just say again, 
we have a composer coming up and we have a costume designer coming up and we also have our 100th episode coming up and we still have to figure out what we're doing for that and we're working on that. Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about these next uh, batch of episodes. I think they're going to be really, really good. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.